Today we're going to continue our discussion of the two different general patterns of virus infections by talking about persistent infections. Last time we talked about acute infections, which we defined as an infection that is rapid and self-limiting. Today, persistent infections, which we'll define as long-term. In fact, they last the life of the host. So it's a very clear distinction from acute infections. And we'll talk about different kinds of persistent infections today. And you'll see that even within a virus family, there are differences, but they're always stable. For a particular virus, like measles virus or herpes simplex virus, the pattern of persistence is stable. It doesn't change over the course of an infection. And one key concept you should remember is that persistent infections begin as an acute infection. You acquire a virus infection, you have an immune response to it, you may or may not have symptoms, and then in contrast to an acute infection, the virus is not cleared and it goes on to persist the life of the host. Let's go to this uh, graph which we showed last time, and it shows you the general patterns of infection with acute infection at the top, and again, on, on the y-axis is virus production. Uh, on the x-axis is time, acute infection, uh, virus production accompanied with or without disease. The, the disease is the red bar, but the key is resolution. And on the bottom are all different kinds of persistent infections. So they're all persistent, and we, we distinguish different kinds. Uh, one of the major ones that we'll talk about today is the latent persistent infection where, again, the virus is with you for the life of the host, but there are periods of virus production followed by or interspersed with periods where there is no virus detectable at all. And that's why we call it latent, because the genome is there, but virus is not being produced. And herpes simplex is a great example. You have periods of what look like acute infections. You have virus production accompanied with disease, or maybe not. Right? Again, viruses can be asymptomatic. And then the virus is seemingly cleared. There's no virus detected, but the genomes are there and they can be reactivated. And that happens often in your lifetime. For some people, have a monthly reactivation of herpes simplex virus. Uh, below that is another example, the third line of a persistent infection where we have continuous production of virus throughout the life of the host. This one, there's no disease. So we are making viruses on a daily basis and we're not sick from them. They have evolved to coexist well with us. So that's a persistent asymptomatic infection. And then finally we have persistent pathogenic infections. These are, again, infections where the virus is always being produced. You can see by the blue line, uh, but it's accompanied by uh, disease. And we'll talk about some of those today in more, de in more detail when we tackle HIV in a later lecture. So a couple of points about persistent infections. Again, the acute part of the infection would be ended if the immune system could clear the infection, but in most cases, uh, the immune system cannot clear the infection, so the virus stays. And as I said, there are many mechanisms of that, some of which we'll go into today. Um, sometimes virus particles, proteins, and genomes are made during this persistent infection. It really depends on the virus. So of course, if you have continuous infectious virus production, then you have to make virus particles and genomes and proteins, that's obvious. But in some case, uh, you only have genomes present and there are no viral proteins detected. It really varies according to the virus. There's a whole gamut, there's a whole spectrum of possibilities with uh, persistent infections. As you will see, there's no single mechanism of persistence. If you wanted me to give you a single mechanism, well, it wouldn't be correct, but if you could say what is one common theme among all the persistent infections that we understand, it would be antagonism uh, of immune response in some fashion. But again, f even within a family, as you'll see for the herpes virus family, the mechanisms of persistence differ. But what you can say for sure is that if you don't have cytopathic effects, uh, coupled with reduced host defenses, this is a recipe for a persistent infection. So remember, no cytopathic effects. What do you remember is a consequence of that when the virus doesn't cause cell damage? What are we not going to get? 
We're not going to get inflammation. And because of that, what are we not going to get? A we're not going to get a good adaptive response. Exactly. So a lot of these persistent infections are not cytopathic. We don't get a good adaptive response. And that's one reason for not clearing the infections. And of course, there's an immune modulation going on as well. So not only the virus biologically in itself is not cytopathic. That's one thing that has nothing to do with the immune response. But then in addition, there are antagonists of any immune responses that are occurring. And that is, is one of the ways that we get persistence. So here is a partial list of some persistent human infections. And the red asterisks are those that I'm going to touch upon today. We have a list on the left of uh, different viruses. And in the middle are the sites of persistence uh, in the body. And on the right, uh, the consequences. So for example, adenoviruses are known to persist in adenoids, tonsils, and lymphocytes. These are all lymphoid tissues. And in, there are in many people, we can detect virus, but there's no consequence. And we really, so that's why we have no, no none consequences. But Epstein-Barr virus, um, we're also going to talk about human cytomegalovirus, have uh, a variety of sites of persistence, and they have consequences uh, in the host, as you will see. We'll talk about the hepatitis viruses, and by the name alone, you should know that the consequence is a liver disease called hepatitis. HIV, we will talk about at the end of the course. Today, we'll talk about herpes simplex viruses, type 1 uh, and type 2. We'll talk about some polyoma viruses, which are, again, in all of us, but don't seem to cause any disease unless uh, you are immunosuppressed, uh, and then you have some serious disease. And we'll talk about varicella zoster virus. Let's talk a little bit about immune evasion. We've covered this briefly before, but I want to reinforce it and bring in some new concepts as well. And a key part of immune evasion for persistent viruses is to get around the cytotoxic T cell response. So you remember if we have uh, an infected cell on the bottom, uh, these cells, all cells in our body, produce MHC class one molecules. Uh, those are the blue molecules shown in the middle here. And the function of MHC1, of course, is to present uh, peptides on the surface of the cell so that uh, T cells can sample them and ask, is this a foreign antigen? And if it's foreign, the cells will be killed. We talked about the mechanism of killing by CTL before, but it's an important way to clear an infection. So for many virus, the CTL response is actually what clears the infection, not the antibody response, as we talked uh, last week. So the CTL response is really important. And we know that because there are so many mechanisms for getting around it encoded in virus genomes. We talked about some of those last time. And this is a re reiteration of the same slide that we saw before, uh, which is the MHC1 pathway. And we've dimmed out the actual pathway just to highlight all these yellow boxes, which are viral mechanisms for an, uh, antagonizing MHC1. Again, what we have on the bottom is a virus-infected cell. It could be any cell in your body. And on the top is a cytotoxic T lymphocyte, which is sampling a peptide presented in MHC class 1. And that peptide got there by a circuitous pathway. Remember, the virus protein is made in the cytoplasm. Uh, some of it is directed to the proteasome, which chops it up into peptides. Peptides are transported into the endoplasmic reticulum by a transporter called the TAP transporter, shown uh, on the left. The peptides are loaded into MHC1, and then MHC1 goes to the surface via the secretory pathway through the Golgi uh, and ends up on the surface. Now, viral proteins antagonize so many steps, and these are just a few of them. It's really remarkable. For example, adenoviruses and uh, HIV uh, encode inhibitors of transcription of these essential genes, the MHC, for example. Uh, an HIV protein prevents export uh, of mRNAs uh, and downregulates this pathway. Some other proteins uh, pull uh, the heavy chain out of the uh, endosome, uh, endo endoplasmic reticulum so that it's degraded. Many viral proteins inhibit antigen processing and transport through the TAP. Uh, transport to the surface, uh, and uh, some proteins downregulate the MHC1 on the surface. It goes up 
to the surface, and then these proteins cause it to be sent back into the lysosome for degradation. Now you can see the vast majority of the proteins uh, on this slide are, in fact, coded by herpes viruses. Uh, her human cytomegalovirus, for example, herpes simplex virus, Epstein-Barr virus. We're going to be talking about those today. These are, again, the viruses that infect all of you. And then we have HIV-1 as well, which is another virus that causes a persistent infection. So MHC-1 is a major target of antagonism. And so you, you cannot clear infection, and that's why you get persistence. I should say that's in part why you get persistence, because the virus still has to be able to persist in some place in your body, and that's another issue we'll deal with altogether. Now, another way that viruses can escape CTLs is shown on this slide, and these are called CTL escape mutants. Now, remember, in a CTL, the CTL is recognizing a peptide displayed in MHC1 on the cell surface. That peptide is processed from a longer precursor and loaded onto MHC1. So here on the left, is a diagram in a different way from the previous slide of the MHC1 complex. Uh, the viral protein is shown uh, in green and it's processed and it fits into a nice pocket uh, on the surface of the MHC1. And of course, uh, that's the cell that's gonna present the MHC1 and eventually the MHC1 will be on the surface. Uh, and then the peptide again in green is recognized by the T cell receptor on the CD8 positive T cell. So that's the situation on the left. Now, um, escape mutants are exactly as they see, as, as it seems. What happens is one or a few amino acids in the epitope that is loaded onto the MHC is changed. As we'll see later, viruses mutate extensively when they replicate. So every cell is full of a collection of mutated sequences. And in this case, one of them happens to be a um, <clears throat> a peptide, an amino acid change in this T cell peptide, the peptide recognized by the T cell, uh, which causes uh, poor recognition of the peptide by the T cell. So just that one blue amino acid change there makes the peptide not fit very well uh, into uh, the MHC and it's not well recognized by the CD8 T cell. And we recognize this kind of evasion in herpes simplex virus and hepatitis C virus. So again, escape mutants, just like you can have antibody escape mutants, where the virus can, you can select for viruses that have different amino acids in the site where the antibody is binding so that the antibody doesn't bind well anymore, you can have CTL escape mutants as well. Another neat mechanism for immune evasion, which we haven't talked about before, is to actually kill the CTL. So the CTL is trying to kill an infected cell, right? But sometimes the infected cell kills the CTL. And obviously that's a great evasion because then the CTL can't kill you. And here, uh, so that's a viral defense, of course. Now, how does this happen? CTLs have receptors uh, on their surfaces for a variety of cytokines. Um, which they would bind and, and sense and, and, and migrate to the right place or, or do the right activities. Uh, and many of these uh, receptors, when bound by ligands, uh, lead to apoptosis, programmed cell death. And so, for example, the binding of TNF to its receptor, the binding of FASL to its receptor, the binding of APO2D or TRAIL to its receptor, all of these initiate a signaling cascade leading to caspase activation and program cell death. So the cell dies. And this, we mentioned this briefly before because, for example, in, in the context of tumor necrosis factor, TNF, this is a cytokine produced uh, by infected cells, and it's, it kills cells. It leads to program cell death. As a way to eliminate infection, you kill the infected cell early on to prevent viral spread. Well, it turns out that some viruses induce fast ligand uh, on the cell, on the infected cell surface. So that when the CTL comes by and samples the antigen in MHC1, at the same time fast ligand is produced, it binds the receptor for fast ligand and the CTL dies before it can kill the host cell. All right, so these receptors are on the CTL. The again, the infected cell is producing fast ligand if it's infected with HIV or CMV. Fast ligand binds to the CTL and kills it before the CTL can kill the infected cell. I think you can see that this is a great way to avoid 
uh, CTL elimination. So if in fact all of the viral strategies have not prevented the peptide from getting on the surface in MHC1, the last resort is you can actually kill the CTL. There are also parts of our body that by nature have reduced immune surveillance because if they had more in, uh, immune surveillance, uh, they would be damaged. And this includes the central nervous system. So you don't want to make proteins in the central nervous system that are pro-apoptotic because there are lots of non-renewable cells there. They are like neurons. And so this is considered an immune, we call them immune privileged sites or have reduced immune surveillance uh, because if we did respond, the cells would be damaged. Other examples call, or include the vitreous humor in the eye, this, the liquid inside of your eye. We don't want to have um, activi immune activities uh, in there. Um, and other areas of lymphoid dra drainage. The, the eye has, in fact, high fast ligand in it, in the aqueous, the vitreous humor, the, the liquid inside of the eye, so that if any CTLs came in, trying to clear a virus infection, they would be killed immediately so that they wouldn't kill uh, eye cells, which you don't want to do, I presume. Now, why don't you want to have an immune response besides killing cells that are non-renewable? You know, when you, when you have immune activities, you have inflammation, right? You have flu fluid accumulation, swelling, and so forth. And in certain areas, you just don't want that, such as your eye. You don't want your eye to be filling with fluid and swelling. It would pop. Well, not really, but it would be painful. So you prevent that by uh, having things like FASL. And we often get persistent infections of these tissues. Now, last year, I gave this lecture. And the next week, a paper was published on the follow-up of some Ebola virus survivors, which this guy was a physician who came back from Africa. He had Ebola. He was you know, in the hospital for a long time. He recovered, and then uh, weeks later, developed uveitis, an inflammation of the eye, uh, and then uh, they isolated virus from the aqueous humor 14 weeks after the onset and nine weeks after clearance of viremia. So people are, clear, are declared free of Ebola. Uh, you, you sample the blood, no more virus found by PCR, go home. And this fellow came back with an eye infection, and they got infectious virus. They put a needle into his eye and pulled it out. It was not in his tears, so he's not shedding it. But why is this? This was a perfect illustration of the slide I just showed you. The eye is an immunoprivileged site. So Ebola got in there somehow. We don't know how, but it's not eliminated because it has a reduced immune response. And how long it can remain, we're not sure. Uh, what are the long-term consequences? What's the epidemiological impact is really interesting. This, whether this is even rare or not, we don't know because not everyone will let us put a needle into their eye and sample the fluid, because that's what you have to do uh, to show this. So the exact incidence is really an unknown. But again, uh, ocular fluid, and if you read the paper, they will talk about the eye being an immune privileged site. In addition, many viruses infect cells of the immune system. Uh, we talked about how measles virus infects antigen-presenting cells last time. That's certainly going to suppress the immune response. HIV infects many cells of the immune response. And of course, that if you infect the cells of the immune system, that's a great way to allow yourself to persist. That makes perfect sense, and it's a no-brainer. OK, the first question is, which of the following are features of persistent infections? They last the lifetime of the host. Viral immune modulation is involved. Immune cells may be infected. They may occur in areas of reduced immune surveillance or all of the above. Oh my gosh, look at this. You can all go. It's never happened, I don't think. Yes, they, all of the above. To what do we ascribe this unprecedented score? Yeah, doesn't matter, do it again. Excellent, very good. All right, let's talk about a couple of examples of viruses that cause persistent infections. Again, we have some where we don't understand the mechanism and others where we understand it somewhat well. First one, measles virus. And you may be thinking, I hope you're thinking, wait a minute, didn't you say that, that was an acute infection last time? And I did. And this is an example of how 
not everything is clear cut in biology. In fact, if you try and make it clear cut, it's probably not a good thing. You know, I, I talk about acute and persistent infections, but the line is blurry. Sometimes acute infections may also become persistent ones as well. So measles, remember, a very contagious human virus, 114,900 deaths in 2014, all of which, of course, are preventable by a vaccine that's not used uh, in those areas. You get lifelong immunity after infection. This is a classic of acute infection. We talked about how it's acquired and spread last time. You get it, you develop a rash. After so many weeks, the virus is, is resolved and you're better. It's gone. But in a fraction of kids, apparently, uh, some form of the virus remains. And many years later, you get it, they develop a disease called subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. And this is a progressive degenerative encephalitis. I just found the other day a case report of a young child in Oregon. Uh, you can find it, I think it's in the New England Journal. Um, he only got one sh shot of his measles vaccine. He was living in the Philippines and uh, developed measles like a year, a year later. So I think he was two years old when he developed measles. And then when he was uh, seven or eight years old in the US, it's such a sad case report to read. You know, his parents said he was smart, he got A's, he was playing sports, and all of a sudden he would stumble and fall, he couldn't speak well, and he totally degenerated, and they diagnosed it as SSPE. Eventually he died uh, within two years after the onset of that. It's, it's uniformly fatal, and it's associated with a previous measles infection. The rate is very low. One in a million kids who have had measles will get this disease. There's a six to eight year incubation period. And we cannot detect infectious virus in these children. All we can see is viral nuclear protein in the brain. No infectious virus. So it's the RNA complex with protein. So what is going on here? We don't know. We can see these nuclear proteins spread between neurons. So they go from one neuron to another across the synapse. Um, and why they're triggering this degeneration, we have no clue. Of course, very few people study this because it's so rare. But it's uniformly fatal. Very, very sad in these young kids. Now, it is completely preventable by vaccination. So in the US, we, we typically don't see this. In countries where there is still measles, there will still be uh, SSPE. Now, he received one dose of measles vaccine, and it's recommended that everyone have two. But also, he was very young when he received it. You shouldn't get it at less than a year of age, and he did. So th this is another reason probably why he, didn't, he wasn't able to fight off infection. But if you are immunized after the first year and you get two doses, you will not get measles and you will prevent SSPE. But again, we don't know how this is happening, but we d this is obviously a persistent infection of some kind. Uh, another example of a persistent infection, this one has a little better ending. These are polyomaviruses. Uh, these are small DNA viruses, double-stranded DNA. So SV40, which we talked about a lot in terms of DNA replication and transcription, that's a polyomavirus. Um, small double-stranded DNA circles, small icosahedral particles. And shown here is a phylogeny of the different uh, polyomaviruses. Uh, there are polyomaviruses that infect uh, different animals, for example, birds and monkeys, uh, and, the, the, and primates, I should say. And the ones with asterisks uh, on them are the polyomaviruses of humans. Now there are something like 11 or 13 different human polyomaviruses. And this group up here uh, was originally isolated from a Wookiee. We call them Wookiee polyomaviruses. Do you believe me? So they're called Wookiee polyomaviruses because one of them is uh, WU, which is Washington University, and the other is KI, which is the Karolinska Institute. That's where they came from. So someone thought it would be cute to name them Wookiee viruses. Okay, and uh, the, so the asterisks one, most of you have these in you at this moment. You have actual infectious virus. You get infected very early on, and they replicate through your whole life, and you shed them, and you're fine. So this is an example of a persistent infection, never cleared, but no pathology uh, either. So you're infected for life. Um, they, these viruses infect a variety of organs, kidney, intestine, respiratory tract. 
if I were to take your urine, which I don't want to do, but if I did and sampled it, I would find up to 100,000 particles per mil in your urine because it's replicating in the kidney. And it, you're fine. Your kidney is, is, is not problematic at all. And it's only if you um, get immunosuppressed that you might have a problem. So if you need an organ transplant and you get drugs to immunosuppress so you don't reject it, or if you have an infection that will immunosuppress you, like measles, which you shouldn't get, or HIV, uh, you will get immunosuppressed. And these viruses start replicating like crazy. And then they cause tissue damage. So you can get kidney damage. Uh, one disease, PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, these, some of these viruses will go to your brain. So a PML occurs in patients who are being immunosuppressed for a multiple sclerosis. So multiple sclerosis is thought to be in part an autoimmune disease. So you are given an, a monoclonal antibody that's immunosuppressive. And unfortunately, that allows these polyomaviruses to replicate like mad and they go in your brain, they cause this disease, which is very serious. We don't know how they're persisting. They're getting along. Obviously, they're evading the immune response. They're not causing any disease and they remain with you. So next time you go to the bathroom and you flush the toilet, remember you're generating an aerosol of polyomaviruses because it's in your urine, you're excreting it. And as I said, after this course, not only will you not eat or walk barefoot in a shower, you will not go to public restrooms. This is just one of many things you will no longer do after taking this course. So you all are excreting this and they're absolutely compatible with our existence. Now, moving on to some more pathogenic uh, persistent viruses, hepatitis B viruses. Anybody remember the genome of hepatitis B virus? What's a feature of it? Sorry? It's gapped, that's right. And uh, double-stranded gap, and it all has to be repaired before it goes in the cell. And remember, it has reverse transcriptase as part of its life cycle. These are transmitted by exposure, exposure to blood, the virus has a viremic phase, very high titers in the blood. It can be transmitted at childbirth from mother to child, you know, lots of blood uh, being uh, spent there. Transfusions, if you don't check the blood supply at one point before we knew about hep B, we would spread it by transfusions. It's trans transmitted by sex, drug use. Tattooing is a big one. It's another thing you will never do after this course is get a tattoo, you gotta be crazy because they don't sterilize the needles. And how do you know where that needle has been before you? They'll tell you they sterilize it, but they don't do it well enough. And this is a great way to get hepatitis. The next virus, hep C, do you know who got hep C from a tattoo? I know you know this. Pam Anderson, famous, she made hep C famous because she got a tattoo and she got hep C from it. So also another way is people sharing razors. I don't know who shares razors, but apparently it's been spread by that as well because when you shave your face or your legs, you cut yourself and you contaminate the razor and then the next person. So don't do that either, okay? Don't eat the mints, don't share razors, don't get tattoos. If you wanna get a tattoo, go to a physician who will guarantee, but they can't do art, so that's gonna be the problem. All right, so this, you acquire this virus by any of these routes, goes right to your liver, replicates in the hepatocytes of your liver, that's the main target. Most people, this is not a problem. 95% of adults can resolve an acute infection. So you get acute hepatitis, liver infection, 95% of adults can clear it. Kids are not so good at clearing it. And that's a problem because they remain infected uh, for their entire lives. 350 million people worldwide have chronic hepatitis B virus infection. A lot of people being infected by many different routes. And a big problem here is if you get persistently infected, you develop liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma. So let's look at the two patterns of infection. So this is a virus with an acute and a persistent uh, pattern. On the left is acute hepatitis B. So on the bottom we have weeks after exposure and on the y-axis are, are a variety of parameters that we're measuring. And one of them is in red, uh, hepatitis B surface antigen. That's the particle, a protein that makes up the particle, it's a measure of how much virus is being produced. And we're also measuring DNA in, in green. So you can see at about nine or 10 weeks, we have a peak of uh, virus production. And in black is the measurement of a liver enzyme, alanine transferase. But that's the, the nature of it isn't important. All it means is that 
this enzyme should not be in your blood if you're healthy. If your liver cells are breaking, that enzyme is present. It's a measure of liver damage. But you can see this infection is clearing. By 24, 32 weeks uh, exposure, you have clearance of viral particles. The DNA lasts a little bit longer, but eventually this infection is cleared. And then you have antibodies uh, to the various viral proteins. You can see in blue and red, uh, first IgM and then IgG. So that's a typical acute infection. Most adults, again, 95% of adults will clear the infection in this manner. But uh, some adults and many kids go on to chronic hep B where, look, the DNA keeps up for forever, essentially, for your whole life until you die. The liver enzymes are always high. You have constant liver damage. You have constant viral proteins being produced. And uh, this is even in the face of an immune response. You have an immune response, but the virus is still persisting. Even though the, the hepatocytes are being killed, the virus is not cytopathic. It's the CTLs that are killing the infected liver cells. So this is an example of immunopathology. Remember, the virus is not cytopathic. Now, if the virus is not cytopathic, what do you think is a consequence of that? I just asked you this question, but I want to ask you it again. If the virus is not cytopathic, what is going to be lacking? A good adaptive response, and that's probably one reason why we don't get clearance here. And whatever CTLs are made go on to kill hepatocytes. So you have CTL killing of hepatocytes, they regenerate, there's still virus around, they're killed again. You have cycles of killing and regeneration. You end up getting fibrosis, scarring of the liver, cirrhosis, liver failure, and uh, cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma after 20 to 30 years of this chronic infection. And you know, even though in the previous slide you saw elevated liver enzymes and virus present, many of these individuals with chronic hep B appear healthy. They don't have any overt symptoms. But eventually, slowly their livers are failing, and eventually they will either have a failed liver requiring a transplant or they get liver cancer. So that's chronic hep B. Um, we do have a vaccine against hepatitis B virus, and we have some antiviral drugs. Uh, the problem right now is that we have so many, so many infected people globally, they, they simply pass it on to children during childbirth, for example, or they pass it on to uh, other people via these, these methods that I talked about. So very hard to interrupt transmission. So again, a persistent infection where uh, the virus is replicating, the immune response is not able to clear uh, infection. Another virus causing hepatitis is hepatitis C virus, made famous by Pam Anderson because she got it by exposure to it, by getting a tattoo, which I presume the, the needle it used was contaminated from the previous customer. This is a different virus. This is an RNA virus. It is a plus-stranded virus in the flaviviridae family, flaviviridae, with West Nile and Zika viruses. So it's got an envelope and it's got a capsid, a protein capsid, uh, surrounding a plus-stranded RNA genome. If you, in case you're wondering, we have hepatitis A, B, C, D, E, and maybe G. So you have up to six hepatitis viruses, and they're all different. Uh, this is, again, just like hep B, transmitted by exposure to contaminated blood, sex, drugs use, tattooing during birth. So drug use is a big deal here. Um, People, you know, are, drug addicts are, need to have their fixes, and they use needles over and over again, even though they're plastic needles. Uh, the, the, the number of needles produced globally has increased in the last 20 years phenomenally, um, from, uh, from a million to tens, 20, hundreds of millions of needles, and these are used to transmit infection. Even during, both, you can, during birth, you can have transmission as well. 2.2% uh, of the human population, 185 million people uh, are infected. <clears throat> this is the um, survey of the world for antibodies against hepatitis C, so you can see where uh, the highest incidence is. So here we have uh, the highest, over 3.5% of the population seropositive, parts of Africa, Middle East, and Asia. Uh, moderate infections, you can see uh, el elsewhere, South America, and low infections like here in the US. So every country has an issue. In particular, Egypt um, is very interesting. There used to be very low hep C in Egypt until um, there was a campaign, I believe, in the 50s, I might be wrong, 40s or 50s, 
they had parasite infections in Egypt, so the government wanted to get rid of this, so they were injecting people with anti-parasite drugs, and they reused the needles. They were glass needles, they didn't sterilize them, so they, you know, you inject someone, you get a little bit of blood in the needle and you give it to the next person. So they spread, they spread HCV to the population. This has happened in other countries as well. And we'll see later, this is probably how HIV spread uh, throughout Africa, by reusing uh, reusable needles. All right, so hep C is a global problem as well. This infection also has an acute and chronic phase. Uh, you get first infected with hep C, the acute infection, you get hepatitis, um, you have jaundice, yellowing of your, the whites of your eyes, for, for example. Um, this, uh, in three to six months, 10 to 40% of the people infected will recover. Many people don't even know they're infected initially because the symptoms are quite mild. But 60 to 90% of people do not clear infection. Uh, they go on to have a persistent infection. And uh, that's, uh, again, associated with chronic infection of the liver and some other symptoms, including uh, depression. And after about 30 years or so, uh, some people go on forever. 70 to 90%, 98% of these individuals go on having asymptomatic persistent infections for their entire life. They're fine. But a, a fraction of individuals between 2 and 30% go into end stage uh, liver disease, including hepatocellular uh, carcinoma, HCC, and cirrhosis, and so forth. So this can be a fatal uh, disease. Uh, on the bottom is a graph uh, of uh, hep C RNA and liver enzymes during the acute and persistent phases. So we're looking at months after infection. Uh, you can see the red is hep C uh, RNA, and you can see it peaks uh, at about a month after infection is rapidly cleared. Uh, and the liver enzymes um, can also be peaking here as well. Alanine transferase, so the dotted lines you can see. In the chronic phase, it peaks and goes down along with virus. But in the persistent uh, individuals who, in whom infection lasts through their lifetime, the blue, you can see uh, virus RNA just goes on and on at a, at a fixed level for years. Um, and again, liver enzymes may or may not be elevated. In, this, in these cases, uh, they're pretty low. So again, this, this persistent infection need not be accompanied uh, by disease, but in the long term, a fraction of people will develop uh, substantial liver problems. So uh, in those individuals who clear infection, this clearance is, has been studied to see why these individuals can do this and others cannot. And genome-wide association studies have shown uh, polymorphisms in interferon lambda 3 are associated with enhanced clearance. Why this is, we're not sure. That's just an observation. The virus is able to persist because it has, it encodes a lot of immune modulation mechanisms. We've not talked about this in this class, but you can get an idea of what they are based on what we're talking about. In particular, lots of mechanisms targeting the early interferon responses. And on the bottom is a graph of uh, the age-adjusted mortality rate per 100,000 people globally, and uh, this is from 1999 to 2007, which shows you that the mortality for Hep B has maintained this at a steady level. Uh, that of HIV has gone down because we are able to control infection with drugs and education about how not to transmit infection has helped. But look at Hep C, it's, it's been rising. This is a serious infection uh, which doesn't really get as much attention as HIV. Now we do, for many years we had uh, antiviral treatments which consisted of interferon, giving interferon to people. And as you may know already from me telling you, uh, interferon has its own issues. If you give people interferon, they get side effects. And many people had very uh, serious side effects after interferon treatment. They wouldn't continue being treated. And there was also resistance to the drug as well. Now we have brand new drugs that have been developed which are very effective targeting viral proteins specifically. We'll talk about those uh, later on, but they could effectively eliminate virus from an infected individual. If you take the course of drugs, the virus should be gone, and in theory, these could eliminate infection. The problem is they cost a fortune, and most countries can't afford them. So how these are gonna play out is really not clear yet. 
Uh, the next question, which are shared features of persistent infections with polyoma, HBV, and HCV? Genomes are present but not expressed. Liver damage, kidney damage, virus particles are produced, all of the above. All right, most of you did get D, which is the one feature in common with polyoma, hep B, and hep C. They all are accompanied by infectious particle pr production. Remember, these are persistent infections. Some of you picked A, genomes are present but not expressed. All of these infections make virus, are associated with virus production, so the genome has to be expressed. Uh, liver damage is just hep B and, and hep C, and you guys got that, that's good. Um, it's not, um, obviously not all of the above then. All right, now we're gonna talk about some uh, persistent infections that we also call latent infections because they have periods where we don't see any virus particle production. So this is very different from the hepatitis B and C and from polyoma where we're always having virus particles produced in a persistent infection. So uh, we see, and this varies among the herpes viruses as you'll see, but in some cases the, the viral gene products, the proteins you need uh, to get replication, they're either not made or you make very low quantities. Um, the cells that are infected uh, and re hold the, D the DNA genome of the virus and nothing else, these are not recognized by the immune system because the genome is silent and an infected cell cannot be recognized unless proteins are being made. So we have persistence of the genome, but we have periodic reactivation. That's a key, key term, reactivation, meaning we go from having a silent genome to the genome replicating, expressing, and making virus particles. And this, of course, is a strategy to spread to a new host. If a herpes virus infected you and it became latent and resided as DNA in you for your lifetime, this would not be a good strategy for infecting the population because it's not gonna spread to another host. These viruses all have the ability to go from a silent DNA to a productive infection by reactivation. And that's what spreads it to different people. So again, all of you have most of these uh, herpes viruses in you. Now the state of the genome varies among the different herpes viruses that we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about herpes simplex virus, varicella zoster virus. In these cases, the DNA is not replicating. It's in a non-dividing cell, a neuron, which doesn't divide, so the DNA doesn't have to divide as well. It remains forever in the neuron. In some cases, uh, the DNA is an autonomous self-replicating DNA in a dividing cell, so it exists as an episome. And we're gonna talk about uh, Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, there are other viruses, uh, the papillomaviruses, the hepatitis B virus is often present in this way, and another herpes virus we won't talk about. And finally, there's one example, interesting uh, human herpes virus 6, where the DNA, at least in a fraction of infected people, integrates into the host chromosome, so it replicates with the host, much, much like a provirus, but uh, not in every host. A provirus is in every infected host, and this, as you'll see, it's not in every one. So let's first talk about herpes simplex virus infections. Sero surveys have shown that over 80% of people uh, at least in the US, are seropositives, and that means they have genomes, they have DNA genomes in their peripheral nervous system. So 80% of you uh, have been infected with herpes simplex viruses, there are two types, types one and two, and you have DNA genomes in you, you're harboring them. And this of course is a large DNA containing virus, we talked extensively about the replication and expression of this DNA genome, these are envelope viruses, uh, with glycoproteins that mediate attachment to cells. And of course, millions of people have uh, DNA genomes in their nervous system without symptoms, no symptoms. In fact, some people never have any symptoms even when they reactivate, as you will see. 40 million people uh, experience recurrent herpes disease every year in the US. So that means the virus begins to replicate and they may have uh, disease associated with it, which is typically a a cold sore or a fever sore uh, on the lips, and that's associated with reactivation. There are two types, uh, herpes one and two. Uh, herpes one is generally associated with oral lesions, herpes two with genital lesions, but sometimes the two become uh, mixed. So again, you can become infected with one or the other or both, 
and the genomes would reside latently in, in one or the other place and become reactivated. This is a very well adapted pathogen. In fact, in many cases, uh, people have reactivations. They begin to make infectious virus without any symptoms whatsoever, without a fever sore of any kind. And so you don't know you're infected and you carry on your daily life and you infect other people. So it's a very good strategy uh, for spreading and that's why it's so efficient. So let's take a look at how this infection works. So typically you are infected in your first few years of life. As you're, even as a baby, your mother may have a fever sore or maybe not, maybe she's shedding virus. She's had a reactivated infection and she's close to her baby so she will infect you. The virus will infect mucous membranes in the upper respiratory tract. So here we have a mucosal surface um, and the epithelial cells. It can be a skin, skin, it can be the skin of your lips, it can be the buccal mucosa. But here we have virus particles infecting uh, the skin cells below the uh, initial layer and these cells can be infected they can spread virus laterally from cell to cell and then the virus goes uh, spreads through the cell so it infects the apical layer and then buds from the basal lateral layer uh, and these virus particles can enter the bloodstream there are of course capillaries here and there they can spread to other parts of the body but typically uh, they enter sensory nerve endings so if you have an initial infection on your lips or in your mouth area uh, the sensory nerves that innervate will become infected uh, with the virus and the virus will travel to uh, the sensory neuron cell body. So you'll have a brief acute infection. The baby may have some symptoms of infection, maybe not. And then the infection is silenced and now you have a latent infection. So the, the virus can actually infect not only uh, sensory neurons but sympathetic uh, neurons as well and it could be brought to them uh, by the blood. But typically if you initially get the infection on the lips, the virus stays uh, in your head area. So here we have a diagram of what's happened. We have our epithelial cell layer, which was infected. The virus has traversed it, gotten into a sensory neuron, and the DNA uh, goes into the nucleus, and it remains there silenced. So that's, here we have a single uh, peripheral neuron. These are peripheral neurons now. They're not central nervous system. They're outside of the CNS. And we have the genome there. Uh, as it goes in the nucleus, it's coated with nucleosomes and it's silenced. Nothing gets made except uh, for a single RNA, as we'll see. You can have multiple copies, and this remains in the nucleus uh, as an episome, so it's separate from the chromosome. Of course, uh, neurons don't divide, so there's no need for this DNA to replicate. It remains there as a single or multiple DNA copies, depending on how many virus particles got in uh, initially. And unlike love, herpes is forever. You can't get rid of it. Drugs and vaccines cannot cure a latent infection. Uh, so you, you could prevent an infection with a vaccine, but we don't have one yet. People are working on it. Um, and very typically, if you have a reactivation and you get a fever sore on your lip, many people get multiple sores in their mouths as well. You can go to your doc. He or she will prescribe an antiviral which will inhibit replication and help the sore uh, go away quicker. But that will not get rid of the DNA in the nucleus of the neuron that innervated the cells where you got that fever sore. So you're stuck with this virus forever. So that's a typical persistent infection. The virus is with you for your whole life. So during this latency, so we call it latency again because there's no infectious virus produced. There's just the genome there. During this latency, the only thing that is produced from the genome is a single RNA called the lat latency-associated transcript. It doesn't encode any proteins. It's just an RNA. And from it are made some microRNAs uh, in latently infected neurons. No proteins are translated. We think that these microRNAs help to silence the viral genome so it's not expressed in a latently infected neuron. And that keeps it quiet, so it's invisible to the immune system. It cannot be eliminated. And there are also, of course, contributions of the host to, to keeping this silent. There are various transcription factors. There are various uh, epigenetic mechanisms like silencing of chromatin that keep this genome from being expressed. So there it is in the latent form sitting in your peripheral ganglia as a DNA. 
uh, then there's reactivation periodically and for some people this can be every month but some others it's longer once a year uh, the viral the DNA begins to be expressed and new virus particles are made in that ganglia in that neuron they travel by anterograde transport back to the cells to the uh, epithelial sheet which the nerve innervates and you will find virus particles and mucosal tissue innervated by these uh, these ganglia you may get blisters or fever or cold sores whatever you want to call them but not always sometimes you get virus production but you're not you don't have a blister and that's how why I say uh, you can transmit it very readily by intimate contact so again it can be by uh, kissing or oral contact or it can be sexually transmitted as well depending on where which ganglia are infected so in, in the course of this production of new virus particles there are lots of viral proteins made to it that antagonize antagonize the immune response so before that can kick in and clear infection the virus particles have already reached the cell surface and have spread eventually the immune response uh, corners this infection and goes back to the latent state but it's too, too slow to prevent shedding so it's a good strategy for spreading from host to host you know you, you evade the immune response enough to make enough virus particles to spread uh, but then you go back to your latent state some people never reactivate some people react very frequently so this virus infects you typically say in the on the lips and you have uh, nerves uh, that innervate the lip area you have also nerves in other parts of the face these all come together in what's called the trigeminal ganglia so nerves from the lips the face and the uh, eyes and the forehead all come together here so that's where the herpes genomes reside in the trigeminal ganglia you get an infection on the lip the virus travels up the nerve to the trigeminal ganglia and the DNA resides there and then when it's reactivated the virus replicates there in the ganglion that's the cell body and it comes back out the nerves and you get a fever uh, sore or uh, blister uh, at the original site and again you may you may or may not have a fever sore but uh, this is this is one of the outcomes now what what triggers reactivation this is an interesting question for herpes we know better than we do for the other herpes viruses for herpes simplex virus sunburn ultraviolet light seems to trigger reactivation stress nerve damage hormonal imbalance steroids lots of things you may have experienced the reactivation yourself many people go skiing for the first time in winter and come back with a cold score because of the UV stress can do it as well um, we don't know exactly how they work but these stresses somehow signal to chromatin and the chromatin gets opened up and the virus begins to be transcribed and you get transcription production of viral protein and that activates the viral transcriptional proteins remember the genome is expressed in a series of transcriptional waves and ICP0 is a key protein to be react to cause reactivation ICP0 activates early uh, and late transcription uh, this leads to DNA replication the production of capsid proteins and, and new virus particles so that's reactivation you go from a silent uh, DNA to uh, production of infectious particles uh, the next question is persistence of herpes simplex virus and nerve ganglia requires which of the following continuous episomal DNA replication low-level production of virions silencing of all gene expression except lat and microRNA UV light stress or steroids all of the above 60% of you got the right answer silencing of all gene expression except lat and microRNA you don't have continuous DNA replication remember during the latency period you have just that one copy of DNA in the neuron doesn't have to replicate because the neuron is not replicating and reactivation means it begins to replicate and be expressed you don't have low level production of virions this is different from polyoma hep B and hep C that we talked about there's no virus production and of course UV light stress or steroids is for reactivation not for um, persistence all right another herpes virus same family Epstein-Barr virus another virus that infects many people 95 percent of US adults are seropositive and carry the genome in B lymphocytes so this is a B lymphocyte specific virus studies have been done which show that most individuals uh, get infected at an early age and it happens in college first year of college you get infected 
and uh, you get you can be asymptomatic or you can get mononucleosis. You feel tired, a little febrile, you don't feel like studying or going to classes. Mono, mononucleosis, kissing disease also it's called. Uh, but you may also have an asymptomatic infection. Uh, the infection can also lead to human cancers like Hodgkin's lymphoma, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, Burkitt's lymphoma. I know people here in the US in high school who have developed some of these cancers you know, after being infected at an early age. The virus persists and in some cases uh, they cause cancers. Now how does this virus work? Uh, this one infects very much like herpes, um, the oropharynx. So here we have saliva, epithelial surfaces, dermis. Um, we have virus particles in the primary infection, which you can get either young, at a young age from your parents or uh, later on in life. Uh, they come through, they infect the epithelium and, and bud through very much like herpes simplex, but they infect uh, B cells. Rather than going into a nerve ending like herpes simplex, these viruses infect resting B cells. And you know, there are B cells patrolling the subepithelial surfaces to make sure everything is, is, is okay, not foreign antigens there. And what the virus does is amazing. It, it productively infects these uh, B cells and it makes them transform into a memory B cell. Normally, an antigen would be needed to transform a a resting B cell into a memory B cell, but EBV does it. And the cool thing is, once you become a memory B cell, you last a long time, right? So that's the key to latency with this virus. Uh, the, the latently infected B cells become, uh, me the memory, sorry, the resting B cells become memory cells. Many of them are actually cleared by the immune system, by T cells or NK cells, but uh, a small fraction remain as long-term memory B cells and the viral genome remains in them. Uh, and so B cells are essential for latency of this virus. Now periodically, uh, these latently infected B cells will reactivate. They will begin to produce uh, infectious virus. Many of them will be eliminated eventually by the immune system, cytotoxic T cells here, but some of the cells will escape because of evasion mechanisms. They will go back up uh, to the uh, oropharynx, for example, and virus will be shed into the saliva, and this is a primary mechanism of transmission from one person to another via virus in saliva. So the latency here is in a B cell, uh, not a neuron. Now the DNA uh, is a little different from in the case of uh, herpes viruses. It's a self-replicating episome. Uh, which is silenced in B cells, but if it needs to, if the B cell replicates, the genome will replicate as well. Here we have a limited repertoire of viral gene expression, very different from herpes simplex where you only had the LAT and the microRNAs produced. And these uh, latently infected B cells, where do they go? They don't stay in your buccal mucosa. They travel to uh, lymphoid organs like lymph nodes or spleen or the bone marrow. They may go there and then they, they rest there. So you have within you uh, lymphoid cells containing EBV genomes. And these cells, as I said, uh, are not killed unless they reactivate. So at the initial stage of infected, many infected cell B cells are killed, but a few remain as memory B cells. Those go away, they hide in lymphoid organs and bone marrow, so they're not killed, they're eliminated. But if they reactivate and come out of the bone marrow or the lymphoid organ and begin producing virus, they will be eliminated. But again, as I said, not before some of them go to back to your mouth and shed virus uh, in the saliva. Okay, so that's Epstein-Barr virus. Again, all of you have it. You get initially infected, you may have mono, but then after that, you really don't recognize when you shed virus in your saliva. It's asymptomatic. So some of you could be shedding virus now, and that's how you will spread it to another person. Another herpes virus, uh, varicella zoster virus, VZV. Uh, this initially causes chickenpox in children. Now, we now have a chickenpox vaccine that can be used to prevent this, but when I was a kid, we didn't have this vaccine, and I remember going to school, and there were always kids absent because they were covered with the rash of chickenpox, which is called varicella. You acquire the virus by uh, respiratory secretion. Someone is sneezing or coughing the virus. You inhale it. Uh, it replicates in lymph nodes uh, in your upper tract, 
Uh, you get a primary viremia. The virus then goes to other organs, including liver, spleen, et cetera. Wherever there are lymphoid cells, the virus will replicate there. You get a secondary viremia at about day 14. Uh, and that brings the virus to the skin, and you get the typical rash, so about a two-week period before you get that rash. The virus then enters the termini of sensory neurons, shown at the bottom of this slide, and the genome becomes latent in the nucleus of the sensory neuron, very much like uh, herpes simplex virus. And then it, re it remains latent there, it's silenced, no more virus uh, particles are produced, but then periodically, uh, you may have reactivation with, in the absence of uh, virus production, I'm sorry, in the absence of symptoms and that you can spread it to others uh, by sneezing. But if you're over 50 or so years of age, that reactivation may lead to a disease called herpes zoster or shingles. And this is reactivation in the formation of a rash uh, and it's typically on a, on a very specific line of your skin that's innervated by uh, the particular ganglia uh, in which the virus is latent. So it's a very characteristic spread of the virus. This can be very painful. It can be treated with uh, antivirals. So for, for older people who'd never had a chickenpox vaccine as a child and had natural chickenpox, they are at risk for developing zoster. We have a vaccine for them. It's recommended for people uh, over 50 years of age, which will prevent shingles. So a very interesting situation where we have childhood and adult vaccines. Now, presumably, if we vaccinate all kids for the next 20 years, uh, 30, 40 years, we won't have any adults left that have been infected, so we, we won't need a shingles vaccine any longer. 99% uh, of adults uh, used to be infected before the vaccine. 30% of those will go on to uh, develop zoster, most of them over 50 years of age. Although, I must tell you, uh, a couple of years ago in this course, one of the students came up to me afterwards and you know she was your age she told me she had zoster uh, in her leg it can sometimes appear down there and i was astounded because she's what 22 or 23 years of age so in rare cases maybe in people with compromised immune systems you can get zoster uh, early on during latency the virus is episomal there are a couple of genomes in a small fraction of the neurons they're not replicating again because neurons don't replicate there's no need to replicate uh, viral gene expression is restricted to a few uh, intermediate, immediate, early, early, and late genes. So it's again, it's different from herpes simplex. We get some gene expression. And we don't know what triggers reactivation in this case. Why you get the shingles, why you reactivate and spread virus, we have no idea. Uh, cytomegalovirus, another herpes virus. Uh, again, high seroprevalence globally, up to 99%. And this is a graph of seroprevalence in different ethnic groups and different age groups. You can see from uh, eight to 14 years of age, up to 75 years, you can see the several prevalence rising. It's transmitted by respiratory roots, virus and saliva. It's also transmitted by urine. The virus is in the urine and under conditions of aerosolizing urine, it can be spread and also sexually transmitted. It replicates in uh, leukocytes and uh, in endothelial cells of blood vessels. The primary infection in a normal host is usually asymptomatic, or you may have an illness very much like EBV, a mono-like illness. Uh, you tend to shed virus in the saliva and urine for, up, for months to years. So there's a little bit different pattern of persistency that we've seen in the herpes virus. Eventually, uh, this virus production is, is resolved by your cellular response, but you have latently infected myeloid cells in the bone marrow. And those are these common myeloid precursors in this scheme of uh, differentiation from a hematopoietic stem cell. Uh, the myeloid lineage on the left gives rise to monocytes and macrophages. So we can find viral genomes in the myeloid precursors uh, in monocytes, that's what the circle is, the DNA genome, and in macrophages, but not in any of these other cell types. So it's very specifically restricted. So those cells you, you keep for long periods, they have viral genomes in them, and they can be reactivated periodically to produce uh, more virus. Now this is a major problem for people getting organ transplants. The, the amount of organ transplantation we are doing is increasing because we can do it, we're getting good at it. And of course, a key component is you have to immunosuppress so the person doesn't reject the transplant. And if you have uh, HCV and you get a transplant, or you may acquire HCV via the transplant because they don't throw away organs that have HCV in them, they wouldn't have any organs to transplant, 
that virus can go crazy in you and cause serious disease. It's a huge problem in transplantation, cytomegalovirus uh, infections, and there's a whole branch of transplantation infectious disease medicine that has emerged as a consequence. And this again, because 99% of the population has this virus in them, and if you get immunosuppressed, that's a problem. Another big problem is that the virus can cross the placenta and cause severe multi-organ congenital defects in the baby, often death as well. And uh, here some, here's a chart that shows you the numbers. If you have 1,000 pregnancies, uh, 600 are in women who have CMV before pregnancy, for example. Of these, most of them have babies who are CMV negative. They're healthy. But five, six of them will have babies CMV positive. So in those six, about 10% the virus has crossed uh, the placenta, so 1%. Uh, and then of those six CMV positive babies, one or two will have uh, permanent problems, all sorts of neurological problems, developmental, cognitive problems as well. So those are in women who were uh, CMV positive before pregnancy. They're also a cohort in this study of women who did not have CMV before pregnancy. Here, 400 of them. Seven of them got CMV during their pregnancy. Of those, uh, two had CMV positive babies and one to two babies with permanent problems. You see, th this is about one to two babies per thousand live births overall, whether you have CMV or not. So if you have it, obviously there's not much you can do about it. But if you don't have CMV and you're pregnant, you're advised to try and avoid acquiring it. So this is a real problem um, in terms of birth defects. Something that's really been forgotten, I think, in the uh, Zika outbreak, where there have been a lot, lots of issues with birth defects in, in Brazil, of course, but there are many viruses out there that also cause problems. This last question, what do persistent infections with EBV, VZV, and CMV have in common? B cells are essential for latent infection, may cause congenital birth defects. Viral DNA persists as an episome. The factors governing reactivation are well known, or all of the above. And most of you got DNA persists as an episome. A few of you said B cells. These B cells are only needed for EBV. Birth defects only with HCMV. And the only virus for which we understand the reactivation uh, is um, herpes simplex virus. Right, one more virus in the herpes family. This is very interesting. Human herpes 6 and 7. Uh, these cause a disease in children called exanthem subitum. Uh, it's a mild childhood rash, also called sixth disease, because there are five other viruses that cause rash diseases before it. Uh, over 85% of adults are seropositive. Uh, horizontal infections through respiratory secretions typically parent the child very early in life, and you can see the rash uh, on the upper left. The virus infects lymphoid, endothelial, liver, CNS, salivary cells, and establishes latency in a number of immune cells, monocytes, macrophages, uh, and uh, stem cells. And for HHV7, CD4 positive lymphocytes. The interesting thing here is that in about 1% of individuals, uh, the viral DNA integrates into telomeres at the end of chromosomes. So at the upper middle of this figure, here's a diagram of the HHV6 genome. It has repeats at, at either ends, and the red bars are sequences in the virus genome that looks like telomeres. Telomeres, of course, are sequences at the, at the end of our chromosomes that self-replicate so that the ends, you know, our chromosomes have an end problem during DNA replication and the telomere is added to prevent that from happening. These viruses integrate into that sequence. So on the bottom is cellular integrated HHV6. You can see the viral genome with its two repeats. It's integrated into the cellular uh, chromosome, which is blue, right into the telomere sequence. And so this allows you, this happens in the germline. And so you pass this virus on to your kids in the germline, and once it's in them, it can reactivate and make more virus particles. How reactivation occurs, we don't know, but this is a neat strategy, We're very different from the other herpes viruses. So I heard a seminar today on uh, herpes virus and how they're eliminated by NK cells. Listen to this. 30% of your T cells in you recognize um, cytomegalovirus, and 70% recognize Epstein-Barr virus. Almost all of your T cells are specific for these two herpes viruses, so this should 
uh, impress you the impact that these viruses have had at developing uh, your immune system. So I want to end with this slide, which is a graph of chronic viral infection in all humans on Earth. All right, so on the right, uh, endogenous retroviruses. Every human on Earth has an endogenous retrovirus in their genome. We've talked about that before. So that's 100% of the planet. And look, uh, anelloviruses are little DNA viruses in your blood. HHV 6 and 7, just about everybody on the planet. VZV, Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, the polyoma viruses, uh, adeno-associated virus, and the herpes simplex virus, and then HBV goes down, HCV, et cetera. And HIV is all the way down here. This is amazing how many virus infections. These are the ones we know of. So this is important because when you talk about human health, you know, Right now, everyone, as I've said before, is focusing on the genome. We have to combine that with the microbiome as well as our virome because the presence of these viruses, even if they're in everyone, if you have a specific mutation or a specific microbiome, they could influence the outcome of disease. So we, we really don't do this very well, but this graph shows you that you have to consider the virome when you're looking at human health. <laughs>